Do you like cupcakes? I like cupcakes. You can probably tell that just by looking at me. I don't like them as much as uh, Pat Gray, or actually more specifically, Jackie Cray uh, crafted Kexi cookie. But cupcakes are probably in my top five delicious treats. I'm getting a craving for cupcakes right now just thinking about them. But do you know what could possibly take my hankering for a sweet, spongy dessert away? The murder of innocent children. Sorry to take such a dark turn after that wonderful opening. Cops Frozen Custard Bakery in Milwaukee is the latest victim of the Twitter cancellation mob and all the insanity that comes with it. Just a few days ago, the bakery posted a calendar of, sept, uh, of special uh, cup to upcoming uh, October flavors. And if you kind of look closely, you'll notice something kind of interesting, a hay cupcake flavor for October 9th. What's that? National Pro-Life Cupcake Day, which is really specific. I. That's according to, of course, nationaldaycalendar.com. Let me make sure they get their credit. Uh, on this day, cupcakes are baked to honor those lives of those who are not yet born. <laughs> the day also raises awareness about the issue of abortion. Cupcakes are a sweet way to get a conversation started on a difficult subject. Cupcakes for Life founded the day as a positive way to discuss pro-life awareness. Who knew? You learn something new every day. Anyway, leftists all over Twitter naturally lost their minds over this and then began to call for the boycotting of the shop, shocker, shocker. Twitter is as Twitter does, after all, I believe Forrest Gump said something like that. So the online backlash led to cops removing the offending flavor and issuing an apology, come on, saying, quote, linking National Pro-Life Cupcake Day with a long running flavor hay cupcake was an oversight on our part and an honest mistake. We didn't want people to think we wanted babies to live. We're so, so sorry about that. What a strange world. And it, is it actually National Pro-Life Cupcake Day? Not, it's not just National Pro-Life Day, it's, it's Pro-Life and Cupcakes combined. It's, it's amazing. Disappointing, I suppose, that they had to do the apology, but you know, it happens all the time. Angry Twitter typers become sometimes angry in-person burn buildings, downers, those people, and nobody wants that. So of course, you just gotta apologize. And now they have been temporarily appeased until they find their next target sometime within the next, uh, five minutes. So, no word on whether cops will agree to their substitution October 9th cupcake flavor. Aborted fetus swirl. BlazeTV.com slash stew is the place to go. Subscribe to Blaze TV. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video. Do it. Just click it right now. We've had so much growth on YouTube over the past few weeks. We really do appreciate it uh, that you're doing that and uh, subscribing as well. Jorge Ventura joins us with the latest on the deteriorating situation at our southern border. Elon Musk continues to tug at the puppet strings of Twitter. But we start by doing the levers of power. Have you noticed the levers of power are being utilized quite a bit lately? You know, we have a system here in the United States that we developed a long time ago. We didn't do it. We we're just benefiting from it. But our founders did it a long time ago. And I think God inspired it. You know, call me one of those religious zealots. But the idea that basically we all kind of come together in a, an oversized community. And we are all able to believe different things. Some of them really smart. Some of them super crazy. Some of them kind of evil. Some of them super, super sugar and spice. It's like the aborted uh, fetus cupcake. It is something delicious and wonderful that we can all agree on. And we all come together with this idea that capitalism and freedom and a bare bones sort of constitution that just guarantees some rights will allow us all to kind of live and do our own thing and not bother each other. And we all kind of sit there and, and, and we, we respect that fact and we respect our neighbors, even though we might think they're total idiots. That's kind of how we've lived our lives for a long time in the United States. And you know, I don't know if you've noticed this. I don't know if you've ever traveled anywhere else, but it's working out pretty well for us so far. We've got a pretty sweet country here. I don't think you want to move anywhere else. I doubt you do. So why are we always trying to flip this system upside down? And for a long time, the conservative argument was pretty simple. Hey, look, 
We want a smaller government. A smaller government, a limited government with limited scope will allow us to all kind of continue this little experiment that we're dealing with. Where people get to kind of live their own lives and, and not be constantly panicking their neighbors that they disagree with. The left, of course, wanted to utilize the, um, the levers of power more often. They wanted to enforce their beliefs on others from a centralized government that was much more powerful. But there was always a lip service paid to the fundamental sort of foundational truth of America as a place that kind of wants your hands off. You know, stay away from us. You'll see it, of course, with them. The only time you see it is during the abortion debate where they all become libertarians uh, for about five minutes. But like generally speaking, they, the reason they pitched that to America in that way, and it was successful for such a long time, was because that spirit of America is here. I disagree with it when it comes to ending a human life. But generally speaking, Americans want you to kind of keep your distance if you're a government. We don't want to be meshed. We don't want to be controlled by some centralized government in Washington, D.C. If government's going to exist, we want it to be small and as close to us as possible. That's kind of been the thing. And usually what you'd see is something like a Bill Clinton approach, right, where Clinton would say, look, the era of a small government is over. We're just doing common sense things. Barack Obama, for all of his big government uh, policies, still pitched this stuff roughly the same way. He would say, look, you know, we, we are just doing common sense things and we have to do basic things to, to help each other, but we don't, we're not trying to, go, to grow the government to some you know, big socialist thing. We're not trying a big socialist experiment. That was denied by the left. In fact, if you said that Barack Obama wanted socialism, you were called a racist. Now, fast forward to Joe Biden, the moderate, who is supposed to be uh, being moderate while doing moderate things in his moderate presidency, has gone off the rails and enacted really the, the, the most left-wing government we've ever seen, as far as proposals go. But it's more than that. We're also seeing a man who is quite willing to jump across the lines that the Constitution has set up. The separation of powers don't even seem to exist to him. And in addition to that, a man who is overseeing a government that is more and more comfortable with using the levers of power of the government to enforce views on others. This shouldn't happen. This is not what our country is about. Medical groups are now urging the DOJ to investigate threats over gender-affirming care. Now, gender-affirming care is a silly, silly, idiotic uh, attempt to hide what is really going on here. Uh, which is basically when a boy says they are a girl, we act as if they are a girl and give them medical treatments, some permanent, some temporary, or po possibly temporary, um, that will uh, affirm their current view of themselves that is not, of course, supported by the actual facts on the ground. If I were to say that I was a cupcake, you might say, well, you know, you don't look like you're made of frosting and sugar and flour and eggs. And you'd be right. But when I said, no, I am made of frosting and butter and cream and eggs and flour and whatever else I said in that recipe, which, by the way, I need to put a cookbook out immediately, you would, I, I would be the one who was in the wrong. That's something we all just know, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very obvious. Now, it's one thing to get in this argument when you're talking about on Twitter or you're talking about in a, in a college uh, classroom, but now they're trying to get the government involved in enforcing this on people. Uh, the three medical, med medical groups um, sent a letter to the D Justice Department asking it to investigate increasing threats of violence against children's hospitals and physicians. Now, this goes uh, to uh, several hospitals have scaled back services, ramped up security in recent months due to threats and harassment as a wave of laws targeting gender, uh, transgender youth have entered uh, from several Republican states. Now, of course, there are no laws passed in any Republican state that approve of harassment or violence of transgendered youth. That's not a thing, does not exist. It's written this way for a reason to make you think it exists, but of course, none of these laws are actually real things. Uh, what there, there are laws to, to, for example, protect the parents as they're trying to parent their children. There are laws that prevent uh, children from getting life-changing surgeries at very young ages. But of course, what's funny about this is if you bring up those procedures, like they have in some of these children's hospitals, the hospitals all say they're not doing them. 
Now, they will say they're doing them in the promotional videos that are being found by accounts like Libs of TikTok. And when they put those, uh, the, those uh, videos out and the people are saying these things, they act as the person who's posting them is the problem. Well, if the, if the procedure is so justified and so wonderful, why do you care if people are posting your promotional videos? In fact, you, you actually filmed a promotional video to let people know you were doing these surgeries. But that's, of course, across the line now. They are, medical groups are asking TikTok, Twitter, and Meta, Facebook, to do more to, quote, prevent coordinated campaigns of disinformation. Uh, Libs of TikTok uh, uh, is being accused of making false claims about the hospital's gender-affirming care in Boston, Boston Children's Hospital. Now, we went over that story at the time, and while uh, there were, you know, there were some questions about it, we know that they were doing some of these things to people under 18 years of, old, years of age. They were basically saying, well, it wasn't children. It was like 16-year-olds and 15-year-olds. And it's like, well... You know, I don't know. Uh, like, you can draw your line, I suppose, wherever you want on that, but you need to own it. If you're going to have these surgeries for 15-year-olds, you can't sit there and deny it later on. You have to kind of own up to it, and this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to have it both ways. Um, I must quote at least this part from the letter. This is the letter that they sent to Merrick Garland, who is, you know, psychotic. Can you imagine this guy was on the Supreme Court? I mean, well, look, we, you know, certainly Donald Trump gets a lot of credit from the right on this. We, we do criticize Mitch McConnell quite a bit on the right. And we should also remember that he's the guy that held the line on the vote uh, that could have allowed Merrick Garland to become a Supreme Court justice. So thank you to everybody involved in keeping this guy off the Supreme Court. But the uh, letter to Merrick Garland says, providers of evidence-based gender-affirming health care, gosh, that's just quite the sentence right there, and their colleagues are facing increased stress and fear on top of the conditions they have faced while working on the front lines of a global pandemic for nearly three years. Uh, guys, gender affirming care is not the front lines of a global pandemic. I hate to, you could just wait until the pandemic's over to do the gender affirming care uh, that you're claiming you need to do. Uh, as no, life, no lives are on the line when you're talking about snip snip on parts. That's not what's going on here. Uh, he, the uh, prescribing some deep hormones to change people's voices and their bodies, not really the front line of the COVID pandemic. I don't know that you can uh, claim that, uh, but this is just one example. The DOJ may jump in and try to hammer down on uh, dissenting opinions. Does that seem like the First Amendment? doesn't to me. How about California? California has approved a bill to punish doctors who spread false information. Weighing into the fierce national debate over COVID-19 prevention and treatments, the state would be the first to try a legal remedy for vaccine disinformation. Now, look, say what you want about people who don't like vaccines. They get to do what they want to do. You might not like it, but that's OK. You, that's for you to make your decision up about your vaccine intake. It's for them to make up their decision about their vaccine intake. That's the way this is supposed to work. Again, these are fundamental things that have always been here in the United States. This is how we've always handled this. Trying to strike a balance between free speech and public health. That's how this article starts. Trying to strike a balance between free speech and public health. Look, speech, words are not weapons. Speech is not violence. There is no balance between free speech and public health. If someone wants to say, I think the flu is caused by aliens, they should be able to say that. If you're dumb enough to believe it, sorry, that's just the way it works. I'm so sorry, you know, some people are gonna get fooled by BS misinformation online. Just like, by the way, they're constantly fooled by democratic propaganda online. This is the entire business plan of the left. And now they want to stop it. Misinformation online is like central to the reason why there are any Democrats elected in office. And now they want to get rid of it. Shocking. Uh, the law would des designate spreading false or misleading information to patients as unprofessional conduct subject to punishment by the agency that licenses doctors. So they're going to pull the license of these guys. Now, they, as the legislation went through the legislature, they kind of came up with a, a little bit of a limit on it. So they're not going to go after necessarily all this online stuff or public statements and interviews. They're going to go after person to person conduct. But again, like 
that's kind of a weird line. You're saying that like you're 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 at a doctor's appointment, and uh, the doctor tells you, "Hey, uh, don't get this vaccine. It's going to make you turn into a blueberry." And you you go to the the authorities and say, "Hey, this doctor was telling me I was going to turn into a blueberry from this vaccine." Uh, like uh, uh, the the lady on um, uh, Willy Wonka. <laughs> what was her name? Violet. Was that Violet? You're turning Violet. Violet. Um, if it's going to turn you into a blueberry, that's going to be a big problem. Well, now you have to have, I guess, the doctor who's supposed to have some sort of confidence with their patient have to come out and defend themselves by saying they either did say that or they didn't. The person's going to have to out their own medical uh, information. It's a weird line. And it's, I don't know. I'm told by I, all the time when it comes to abortion that we don't want to get in the middle of the, the relationship between patient and doctor. And all of a sudden, it seems like the only thing the left wants to do. How about, we're, while we're on vaccines, can we highlight Joe Biden for a second? Biden thanked a great Coast Guard rescuer for, her, for his hurricane heroics right before he's going to be fired over the idiotic vaccine mandate. Now, again, I'm not telling you you shouldn't take the vaccine. What I am saying, though, is that uh, these vaccine minutes never really made sense from a personal liberty standpoint, to be clear. I mean, I've said that from the very, very beginning. But even if you believe they are the perfect solution to every single problem and uh, you believe for some reason the Constitution does not give you any protection of what you put in your body. Again, these are lines I don't I don't agree with. Now it makes absolutely no sense. Maybe you make the argument in March 2021 uh, that these guys needed to be vaccinated. It was a different time, a different virus. People didn't have natural immunity. Almost everybody has had COVID already or has been vaccinated. We are long past the time that there's any material benefit to these policies. And yet we're going to take a hero that the president of the United States called out by name and toss him in the waste bin over an idiotic policy just so Joe Biden doesn't have to say he was wrong. That's what we're doing here. Again, the force of government, these idiotic policies, when put into practice, really highlight the absurdity of, of, of what they are at their core. Uh, this is a guy, his name is, uh, I'm, I'm, because I'm biased and a Dana a Lash fan, uh, I'm going to say it's Zach Lash because uh, it's spelled the same way, but I don't know if that's exactly how you pronounce it, how he pronounced it. But he says, uh, Biden said, I told him how proud I was of him and thanked him for all the work he and he and his coasties are doing to save lives. Uh, and then, of course, he came out and said, uh, Lash said, hey, look, uh, I uh, submitted a request for religious accommodation. You guys all denied it. Uh, and he said, if I asked any of the people I had saved yesterday, if they wanted to come with me, even though I'm unvaccinated, every single one of them would have said Yes, he told uh, Breitbart. And we told you about the story when it comes to the pro-life thing of the FBI raiding the home of pro-life uh, Christian uh, who was out there at the abortion clinics trying to convince people, please don't kill that particular child. Um, they came to his house with guns, with uh, with agents, and the family was left to watch in horror. Mark Houck was his name, outspoken pro-life activist, author from Pennsylvania. He was arrested. Uh, his wife uh, in his home with seven children uh, after dozens of FBI agents showed up on his lawn and began pounding their front door. I love this. Faithwire had a great uh, answer from, uh, from the FBI when they asked questions. They said, hey, they said dozens of agents were there. And they said, there were not 25 agents. There's only 15 agents. Great. I mean, that's really going to make a huge difference to this family. The bottom line here, though, is not any of these particular issues or particular stories. It's this familiarity. It's this friendliness to this new idea, a new progressive idea to use force to crack down on just people who disagree. You disagree on abortion. We're coming to your house with agents. You disagree on the vaccine. Eh, you're fired. You disagree on what the vaccine does. Eh, you've lost your medical license. This pattern keeps playing out over and over and over again. And it has more than one effect. It not only affects these people and affects our country generally, it also creates a, an opposite force. You're seeing this uh, uh, in, uh, increase on the right as well, where people on the right are saying, hey, look what they're doing to us. We better start doing the same things to them. We better use our power to, to enforce these things when we get it, because if we don't, they're going to roll all over us. And you know what? There's a lot of people that sounds like a really good solution to. So you have this now uh, opposing force and we're in this battle now as to who can use their power more successfully. Number one, 
I don't know if you've ever noticed this, the left usually wins that type of battle. So I don't really like that type of battle. But regardless, it's understandable to need to push back when you're being rolled over all the time. This can't happen. And yet the left continues to try it. We can hope that the American people look at this landscape and take power away from Democrats. Don't reward them for this behavior. But we're six weeks away from an election and then two years away from another one. And these are going to be incredibly important to see what the future of this country entails. Uh, I always listen to uh, podcasts. I, it's a great way to get information, um, whether no matter what you're doing, if you're going for a walk, if you're in your car, uh, if you're at the gym, no matter what you're doing. And I, I also love them at like my kids' Little League games. You know, I'm watching Little League games. I'll get a little of uh, show prep in as I'm listening to an audio book or a podcast. Uh, why can I do this? Well, first of all, I've got Raycon, Raycon wireless earbuds. I can do this every single day because these earbuds are fantastic. They sound better than ever. They have optimized gel tips for the uh, your, you know, perfect in-ear fit, and they, they fit flush uh, to your ear. They don't dangle down like some of these other dopey brands. Raycons give you uh, eight hours of playtime, 32 hours of battery life, and they are priced right to get quality audio, half the price of the other premium audio brands. It's no wonder Raycon's Everyday Earbuds have over 50,000 five-star reviews. Reviews. Go to buyraycon.com slash stew today and use the promo code stew. Get 15% off your Raycon order. B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N. Buyraycon.com slash stew. Get the code stew and get 15% off right now. Buyraycon.com slash stew. Code is stew. Joining me now is Jorge Ventura. He's a field reporter for The Daily Caller. He's always in the middle of everything. Uh, if you haven't caught it yet, uh, be sure to check out his news documentary, uh, Narcofornia. It's available now at narcofornia.com. And you are always in the middle of everything, especially at the border. You've been watching what's going on right now, and it's really been shocking lately. Yes, yeah, it's a what I would call it's a, it's a true humanitarian crisis. Um, so I just left um, Eagle Pass, Texas. For folks who don't know, Eagle Pass, Texas has become now the deadliest crossing zone throughout the whole southern border. And this is because um, to get to Eagle Pass, you do have to swim across the Rio Grande River and migrants that are drowning um, every single day. So I spoke to Eagle Pass fire chief. He was saying before Biden came in, they were averaging between one to two drownings per year. Um, they're at one to two drownings per day. So meaning that his wow. fire chief uh, team is actually embedded with Border Patrol doing these um, rescues. And I actually still been embedded with migrant groups there from Pedas Negas, Mexico, crossing in. And I have got to feel the current of the, of the water. It's very um, strong. And unfortunately, women and children um, are, are passing away. The, the deaths actually are overwhelming officials so bad that they started to bury some of the migrants in their local cemetery. But the issue is, because so many migrants are coming over and they are passing away uh, drowning, they're running out of room. So every county sheriff actually had to call the state of Texas, and now they're, they got refrigerated trailers that are at the border, and they're putting the bodies in there. And it's really sad, too, because if you actually go to the cemetery, it's makeshift crosses with, with pipes, and the majority of the migrants are un unidentified. So you'll see the John Doe for the men, the Jane Doe for the women. But the true heartbreaking is the, when you see the infants, and they have, you see baby John Doe, so uh, babies have also drowned in the Rio Grande River, and the folks down there just, they don't get why there's no kind of national outrage um, to the deaths, um, because they kind of saw the media coverage on Martha's Vineyard. So for them, it's like, wait, where's the media now when, I mean, we literally have kids drowning, you know, uh, coming to, on U.S. soil. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to ask you, because I, we, look, we talked about the, uh, the story in Martha's Vineyard. We've talked about, the, you know, Abbott shipping people and Arizona shipping people uh, to different states. And I, I do think that's worthy of some coverage, mm -hmm. but... The actual border situation is largely ignored, and it seems like the Martha's Vineyard thing in particular is just an opportunity for the national media to say Ron DeSantis is mean, uh, where if they show much, much worse conditions at the actual border, they would have to say the Biden administration is mean, and they want to avoid that at all costs. Yeah, and you know, border czar Kamala Harris has yet to actually go down into the border. I also just left El Paso, Texas, where they're having so many migrants come um, that the shelters have no room for them. So you literally have women and children sleeping on the streets of El Paso, Texas. I interviewed a, a mother who was like digging through clothes and she had a 10 month baby. I mean, you would think that the other mm. side would be outraged by, by that, right? By women and children sleeping on the streets. Um, but 
they get no media outrage. And for folks who don't know, El Paso is a Democratic town. The, de the Democratic mayor is so overwhelmed with the migrants, he actually had to close a million dollars worth of contracts with a few of the charter buses. So they're, El Paso, the Democratic city, is also busing migrants to New York City. Now, you might have not heard that in the mainstream because mm -hmm. it's not going to get the media outrage as if... Abbott did it, but El Paso, Democratic City, is doing the exact same thing, and, and all these towns are just completely overwhelmed. They're scrambling to find resources, and like I said, Eagle Pass, they're scrambling where to even put deceased bodies. Yeah. Um, it's really sad and heartbreaking when you see it. What kind of effect does this have on your average border agent who's down there trying to enforce our laws and our borders and instead is you know, trying to figure out where to bury bodies? You know, their morale, it's as, it's as low as it's ever been. So, so some of the conversations I have with Border Patrol is they say, hey, um, I feel like I'm not doing my job and almost like I'm abating, I'm helping out the cartel by now, instead of actually being a Border Patrol and Border Enforcement, what, what they said they're doing is they're called Border Enrollment, where we just basically mm. wait for migrants, we pick them up like Uber drivers, and we just take them to the processing center. So we no longer stop illegal immigration, we're actually helping it out and aiding it. Um, so a lot of Border Patrol, their morale is low. Um, they're working crazy amount of hours because they can't find even enough agents to put there. And I actually just finished an interview with Maverick County uh, Sheriff who told me, said, hey, Jorge, like, you know, every day my sheriffs are pulling out dead bodies out of the Rio Grande River. It's actually not a normal thing. And a lot of our uh, men and women are develop developing PTSD. It's a mm. huge toll on their, on, their, on their mental health. So there's also that human aspect that I think we forget about um, that the men and women down there at the border face. And the thing is, federal government is not going to give them a hand. So it's really all hands on decks. So when you're at the border, you're going to see Border Patrol working with National Guard, working with county sheriffs, working with constables, working with the, even the fire chief. And like I said, the fire chief was telling me, you know, we were seeing one or two, two drowning per year, it's become a daily thing. It's the new normal in Eagle Pass. What is, what are the, what's the reason for this? I mean, you talk to people who've crossed the border. Mm -hmm. I know you're down there all the time talking to people who are in this situation, who have made these decisions, many of them very bad decisions, uh, to cross the border. Is it just incentives? Is it the fact that Joe Biden and his administration are signaling to the countries of our South, hey, come here, everything's going to be fine, we're going to help you, you're going to be able to stay. Is it an incentive-based thing? Why, why do they say they're coming? The, the main thing is it's the incentive, but also there's no deterrent. So mm. um, as uh, Biden and Kamala were actually campaigning, you, Kamala's actually already putting out the signal saying, hey, we're going to be the more humane administration. If you come, we're not going to uh, deport. Um, so when migrants heard that, they, they almost actually gave the sales pitch to the smugglers themselves. Because now the smugglers communicated that message uh, to the migrants and are, are bringing them in massive amount of caravans. The other thing here, Stu, is actually uh, social media. So a lot of the migrants now, they have already know a family member or friend who've already crossed illegally and got released inside the United States. So for them, once they see that, they say, I want to make the journey too. So when I started covering the border crisis in the beginning... You know, migrants wouldn't want to do interviews. They wouldn't want to be on camera. Fast forward to today, migrant, some migrants who are crossing illegally, they'll be like on Facebook Live. They'll be like streaming it. They'll be on Shh. FaceTime as they're crossing illegally. And I, um, there'll be videos. You guys could go on my Twitter where these huge groups come in and I'm filming. And they're looking at my camera, giving thumbs up, saying Cuba, Cuba, Venezuela. I mean, there's no deterrence and they have no fear. And so far, they're right because we are transporting them. We are releasing them inside the, inside the United States. So um, they're going to keep coming until we have that deterrence is the key factor. Yeah, I think a lot of Americans think of this from our perspective, right, where people are coming into our country, they're breaking our laws, and we don't like that, which is an understandable viewpoint for us. But when you look at it from their perspective, they're in a country where things aren't uh, so great. And this country, at probably the worst, treats it like a speeding ticket to come in, right? I mean, I don't even know if it's that. But I mean, it, it, you know, you might get a slap on the wrist. You might have to go to a court date later on. You know, if I, got, if I rolled through a stoplight down the street, they would do the same thing. I might have to show up to a court date in a few months. Whether I do or not, who knows? They, they are looking at this as something that we don't take seriously. They look at this and they say, well, they don't really care. There's got to be a lot of people who make this decision based on the fact that we're signaling to them this is not a serious issue. Mm -hmm. We want you to come cross the border. We're going to release you. It's just politics. Come on in. It, it, that's exactly what it is. Too. And the thing is, um, majority of migrants. So, like, if you're at a border town right now, and let's say you go fill up a, you know, uh, gas at a gas station. Yeah. You'll actually see migrants there waiting. So what, what I do is I always get out the car and I have a conversation with them. And the thing is, um, they're so overwhelmed, our, our government, that they're actually releasing migrants with court orders. But the thing is, only 13% of that time, a migrant's going to self-report. So once <laughs> a migrant is released, I mean, they're, they're pretty much 
able to do whatever they want. They're actually legally already allowed to stay, um, but they're always giving papers like, hey, report to ICE. But when I speak to Border Patrol sources, they say literally only 13% of the time they even self-report. So this whole thing has been really watered down. It's been also kind of a lack of respect for Border Patrol because like, they literally just cross illegally. Um, and like I said, they'll be on FaceTime. They'll be on, on, you know, on Facebook Live broadcasting the, the crimes of the world. And like I said, so far, they're, they're right. The other kind of dark element here, Stu, is we've now had... A, 250,000 unaccompanied minors reach the border. Mm. So we have in all these children with no parents reaching the border. And the thing is, um, on the U.S. side, we're then releasing them to so-called sponsors that the government is vetting. Uh, Reuters actually just put out a great report that in Houston, Houston Police Department um, is actually worried because some of these migrant children have now gone missing because now they can't follow up with the sponsors. So that's also another element of now we're getting migrant children released inside the United States and our government can't even properly vet the sponsors. These kids are going missing. And, and it's just like not on a, this is not a, a fringe story. Like I said, it's Reuters, it's mainstream, it's, yeah. um, it, it's all out there now. And we get this sort of idea from uh, much of the mainstream that what we're having here are people crossing the border who are good people, who are just trying to make their lives in the United States, and they love it in this country. And, blah. and I'm sure there are those people, of course. But we also have, for example, the drug trade to look mm -hmm. at, right? What, what's the situation now? We're hearing reports of a lot of fentanyl coming across the border. They're finding it all over the country in candy boxes and in rainbow colors and all things that could be really dangerous even to children. What's the, what's the situation with drugs coming across the border right now? So with the drug aspect with, with fentanyl, what a lot of people I think don't know is they think that migrants are just carrying these huge loads and they're coming in the country. Now, right. most of the fentanyl is coming in through the port of entry. Mm -hmm. But when I speak with Border Patrol, they're saying because they need so many men and women on the line, they can't have enough men and women on the actual port of entry. So that's where mm. a fentanyl is, is coming in. It's coming in at record, record, record numbers. Um, the other aspect as well is, Stu, is the gotaway. So the gotaway, for folks who don't know, are the migrants that um, come into the country illegally and Border Patrol is able to detect them through a camera or some other technology, but because they didn't have any men and women there, they're not apprehended. So that number is getting close to one million gotaways. Actually, I just finished a report. We were in Aravaca, Arizona, um, and the, which is one of the capitals for gotaways. And here, you'll see actual cartel members moving in, in through the you know, smuggling routes. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because when I'm in Texas or these other videos you guys see that what I'm reporting, those migrants want to turn themselves in, right? They cross illegally, right. they wait for border patrol and everything. But the gotaways don't want to be apprehended. And the reason is because they either have past criminal history in the U.S. or they're connected with some type of cartel affiliation with, with drugs. So that number, Stu, is getting close to one million. Um, we so far have apprehended over 70 individuals on an FBI terror watch list. So um, another quick reminder that people are not just coming in from Central America and South America. We are getting them folks uh, flying in from the Middle East. And that 73 number is way, Record way number. up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, four or five times as many as the entire Trump administration, exactly. which yep. is really something crazy to think about. Um, so what do we do? Because I, I'm old enough to remember uh, Arizona tried to pass a law mm -hmm. to deal with illegal immigration. And the Supreme Court said, well, you're a state. You're not allowed to do anything about this. And. The state, or the, the state, meaning the federal state, doesn't seem to want to actually enforce these laws. So we, as citizens, are just sitting here, and everyone's coming over the border. They're doing whatever they want. Our government doesn't seem to do anything. The state's not really allowed to do all that much, right. except put, put them on buses or planes and ship them to other parts of the country. I mean, uh, what are we supposed to do here? Well, the, the, you know, when I speak with Border Patrol, I'm like, what, what would you guys need to turn this yeah. around? And the first thing they just said, they said, Jorge, we literally just need to enact the laws that are already on the books. These people enter illegally, we deport, but under, under this administration, it's a it's catch and, and release. So they literally was like, we already have everything. I mean, we could literally mm. turn this around. They don't need a new law. They don't need a new law, anything. And the other thing, too, is that it makes this uh, job difficult for Greg Abbott because Greg Abbott, like you said, is a state. So he technically doesn't even have the power to deport. One thing that I always get you know, from readers is saying, hey, how come Abbott doesn't just deport these illegals back to Mexico? Well, he doesn't have the power of legality. Right. It falls on a state, but then Biden doesn't do anything. So when I do speak with Border Patrol, they said, Dude, we already have the the laws on the on the, on the everything's is is set. Um, the other thing here is um, politically, it doesn't even make sense for the Democrats not to solve this issue. And the reason why I say that is because South Texas, if you look at that base, it's 80 percent um, Hispanic populations, working class, who have been loyal to the Democratic Party. I mean, even some districts for a hundred years. Yeah. And for them not attending to this issue. They are getting, uh, they're seeing the political playback. And what I mean by that, Myra Flores picks up a victory. Yeah. First Hispanic women, Republican, in over 100 years to get that seat. Uh, last year, Javier Villalobos, first Republican mayor for the city of McAllen. Right now you have Cassie Garcia, Republican woman, running in South Texas. Monica De La Cruz. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because they're capitalizing on those Hispanic voters that are upset of the border crisis. Because now you finally have Republican candidates there that say, hey, I'm Hispanic. 
I'm Latino. I look like you. I speak Spanish. Um, and I see the effects of the border crisis. The Democratic Party has abandoned us. So from, from a political standpoint, it doesn't even make sense for the Democrats not even to attend the border crisis because they're losing this voter base that is absolutely yeah. loyal to them. So that's one of the things I'm most fascinated about is seeing the, the, this political tide in South Texas. It's, it's really fascinating. It's interesting because I see that in the numbers. You know, I see that in the vote totals. I see that in the polls. Is it culturally a thing as well? Is it, I mean, are these, these, citizens, these uh, communities coming together and saying, look, we see the Democrats for what they are. We see these problems they brought to us. And we need to change this around. Is it just, is it just you know, an election or two that are, that'll change? Or is this something, a real cultural movement? I think we're seeing the real uh, cultural movement. Is, this, is, and this is because the Democratic Party has started to align with the coastal elites of, of, of America. Mm. And they've gotten away from the working class measures. The thing is, that's a huge impact on Latinos because we're all basically working class. You speak to Latinos in South Texas, uh, very already conservative. They don't believe in abortion, Catholic mm-hmm. uh, communities. But the thing is, the Democrats have always been there to serve them. So they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll vote Democrat. This is the first time where they feel abandoned by the by that mm. party. And now you have a Myra Flores kind of filling that gap, saying, hey, um, I look like you. I'm not this extreme Republican that you hear on MSNBC. I speak Spanish. I'm, I was born in Mexico, but I care about the same policies, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll be there. So what I what I think we're seeing is something that that could outlast, but almost a microcosm because we're seeing Latinos throughout the country start to shift. Latinos don't only only care about immigration, right? It's, it's inflation and other other things. But um, in South Texas, when they see the issue and they see the Democrats not being there, they're 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 really losing out. Like I said, it doesn't make sense. These people are very loyal to them. If you look at the 2016 mm. numbers. I mean, they all went to Hillary Clinton by large margins, but then fast forward to 2020, that's when Donald Trump made those historic gains, and they're not capitalized on that issue. It doesn't make sense at all uh, from a political standpoint. It is a fascinating thing to watch, though. I mean, this is something that, I mean, the the left had built their next Mm -hmm. century on owning every single minority group and their votes, and... Uh, it's going away, and I think that's a great thing. I think that's a great thing. I'm glad that people are waking up. Uh, Jorge Ventura, he's uh, over at the Daily Caller, field reporter there. Uh, his uh, documentary, you got to check it out, Narcofornia. It's at narcofornia.com. Jorge, thanks so much for coming back on the program. This is great. Hey, thanks, Sue. Always glad to be back and, you know, providing these updates for the American audience of what's really happening at the, on the border. <laughs> Well, the market was up today, and uh, that means the economy is fixed. And let me tell you one thing you can do with your money. Um, when, the, when the market goes up, if you made some profits today, take that money out and invest it in StuDoesMerch.com. That's the only way really to own this economy. You own the libs. You own this economy at StuDoesMerch.com. Now, what I love about StuDoesMerch.com is the fact that it has kind of in-your-face stuff and subtle stuff. You know, 624-22, pretty subtle. People don't even know what that date is. You know what it is. It's the date that Roe versus Wade was overturned. And then there's other things like just a picture of Joe Biden with the senility now on, his, uh, on it. You know, wokeness is weakness. Andrew Cuomo is awful. There's a lot of blunt stuff there. There's a lot of subtle stuff, like the Colin Kaepernick shirt is one of my favorite uh, subtle subtle ones, especially for your NFL parties. People will love that if you're going to watch some football with friends. Uh, Always remember that Colin Kaepernick, before Colin Kaepernick ever took a knee, he lost his job to Blaine Gabbard. By the way, did you know the lowest amount of completions by any NFL team over the past decade was the Colin Kaepernick good year? The guys built his career off this one year, the only year that anyone argues he was any good, and uh, he had the lowest amount of completions by any team in the past decade. So he sucks, and that's kind of the point of the shirt. Uh, You can get it all at studosmerch.com. If you use the code STU10, you can save 10%. Saving 10% of your gigantic stock market winnings from today. So studosmerch.com, code is STU10. Back in a second. You can also spend your gigantic winnings in the market at Grip6. Yes, Grip6 has great, customizable, fashionable belts. They have awesome wallets. They have great socks. They have all sorts of cool stuff for you and your active life. And Grip6 is a small company in Utah. They sell in the United States, all over the world as well. And they source almost everything they use to make their products right here 
in America. They are not jutting out of your shirt, uh, these belts, because they are minimalist, but they are also customizable. So you can do the laser etched designs, logos, flags, all sorts of cool stuff. Make the belt buckle uh, personal. You can also get the carbon fiber stuff, which is great because you don't set off the metal detectors at the airport. If you're a sales guy, you're out there traveling all the time. Great option for you. Grip6.com slash stew. Just go there. Check out all their stuff. You're going to like a lot of this stuff and see what you see what you enjoy. Grip6.com. Use the code stew there. You get 15% off. It's grip, the number six, dot com slash stew. Get 15% off today. Elon Musk uh, says he's going to buy Twitter again. I mean, could I, could I be less interested in this? Uh, honestly, I don't even like Twitter now and i don't care what he does with it honestly but i will say it's been fascinating to watch this from a business perspective and we did say on this program that eventually he was just going to buy it so even though he said he's not going to buy it 100 times he's now saying he is going to buy it i guess at 54 dollars and 20 cents because 420 is funny i think that's the whole reason for this uh gavin newsom has signed a bill decriminalizing most jaywalking in california which i guess because it 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 affects minorities more This is really the the description they're giving here as to why you would decriminalize jaywalking. Because I guess minorities get caught more jaywalking, so it's unfair to them. My understanding of jaywalking is to make, like, you don't want people hit by cars. Now, I am not going to go as far to say that Gavin Newsom, who is basically uh, American psycho, uh, Patrick Bateman, is going to decriminalize uh, jaywalking just because he wants to see people get hit by cars. But I'm also not not going to say that because it's almost definitely true. Uh, Joe Biden has an incredible message uh, about his history and where he grew up. I want you to listen to this and internalize it a little bit. And so I, uh, I uh, was sort of raised uh, mm-hmm. in the Puerto Rican community at home. Really? Politically. In Delaware? And so we, and we came here for a long time. Uh, both for business and pleasure, since mm-hmm. you're part of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and Delaware is as well, and I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee. I spent a lot of time in the northern part of the state. He went on to like argue about how what percentage of of minorities he had in his state, and it was really a weird rant. The guy is. He always has this, he, he has to always turn everything to a story about himself. I don't know if anyone's noticed this. It's a very weird thing he does where he constantly, it's like, hey, you know, a soldier dies in battle. You know, I had a son. It's, it's always about him. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Joe Biden is Puerto Rican or grew up in the Puerto Rican community in, in absolutely 100 percent Puerto Rican Delaware. And finally, Biden has told Al Sharpton he will run for president in 2024. Now, when I first heard this, I thought, well, Al Sharpton's telling us this. So we know for sure for the first time that Joe Biden is not running for president. But Joe Biden actually said it. Now, did he know where he was when he said it? That I can't tell you. But I will tell you, I think he is going to run. I, you know, I, unless they get absolutely destroyed in this midterm, then maybe the pressure will get too big. But... Honestly, I think he wants this power. He's been looking for it his entire life, and he does not want to give it up. Okay, so here's what happened. We told you before about the brutal and completely wrong canceling of Guinea Pig Awareness Week. Yes, it was pushed back. Why? Because the queen died. And apparently we could not be aware of guinea pigs and mourn the queen's death on the same week. So that went away. And what happens when that goes away? Terrible, terrible things. Watch. Just today, ACC rescued 22 guinea pigs that were dumped in a building lobby, five of which were pregnant. Roughly 600 were dropped off just this year, and almost all of them are younger than three years old, Mm. signaling them to be impulse pandemic purchases. City Council is working on a bill that can ban the sale of guinea pigs in pet stores. But it is a lengthy process, and until then, we need the help of New Yorkers to help adopt, foster, and spread the word. Guinea pigs are being abandoned around the city at an alarming rate, and they need your help. Visit nycacc.org to see our adoptable guinea pigs and to learn more information. Wait, so why why are they going to ban guinea pigs from being purchased at stores? It just seems terrible. Uh, you know, a lot of people bought these guinea pigs. They then were like, ah, I got to go back to work. I can't really take care of them. So they're dropping them off. First of all, they're all pregnant because you're keeping them in the same container. OK, there's all they're going crazy. They're going guinea pig crazy. But I will tell you this. No, George will be returned. Not George, our skinny pig, our hairless guinea pig here at the Stew household. 
will remain in the household for as long he, as he needs to be there. No adoption is necessary.